Howdy folks! Over the years I have read a lot of science fiction and one of my favorite sci-fi writers is the late great Grandmaster Robert A. Heinlein. And so it's kind of ironic that when I saw the movie uh, Starship Troopers in 1997 I had not read the book. And frankly I was a little baffled by what I saw. I just didn't seem to be up to Heinlein's standards. Uh, so eventually I did read the book and I thought, you know what, I should do a comparative review, book versus movie. So I finally got around to it. When I first saw Starship Troopers, the movie, I was a little puzzled as far as what Heinlein had been trying to accomplish here, and so I had to read the book and saw that, in fact, there was quite a bit of differences <laughs> in the book and the movie, and which is often the case. Now, let's start with the book, say a little bit about that, and, and sum it up for people who ha haven't, perhaps haven't read it or haven't seen it. It was Heinlein's last young adult book, which they called Juveniles at the time. It's premise was that 700 years in the future, uh, humankind is mostly united, you know, a fairly peaceful and prosperous world government, and then we have these space colonies as well, but we still have to have a military because we have this danger, this menace of certain alien races who oppose us. Because of that, this is, it has become kind of a militarized society, and the biggest threat is a a race of arachnoids uh, that are, well, officially we call them the pseudo-arachnids, but in slang they're called the bugs. And this movie was written in 1959, and so you have a lot of that kind of, uh, I guess, American triumphalism in, in the sense that this kind of system, our system, has persevered. There have been some severe troubles in the intervening centuries, but we fixed them and we've kind of brought liberal democracy to the whole planet with a few little tweaks. For example, uh, citizenship is reserved for military veterans. Uh, if, you've not, if you haven't served, you cannot vote. And this is supposed to keep the government being more responsible. People who've had the experience of being in the military have that added level of maturity. It's not just men, because there are women in the military, even in, in Heinlein's book. And another thing that's different is that uh, punishment for lawbreakers and uh, miscreants is pretty severe, unlike the current day. That was one of the things Heinlein saw as a big problem, was uh, coddling criminals. And so capital punishment is still in force. And in some situations, corporal punishment is used. Like in the military, they still do flogging for you know, severe infractions. Anyway, the story itself follows a young, a young man named Johnny Rico. And in the book, he's from Buenos Aires, and uh, he is of Filipino extraction, which is something you never see portrayed in the adaptations. They, they always show him as a white guy. Um, but it, you, you really get the impression that Heinlein was kind of into the diversity thing because of this. And... And he has a girlfriend named Carmen Ibanez, so Hispanic, definitely. And uh, he has this uh, question as a young man graduating from high school, what should I do with my life? And some of his friends are joining the Space Marines. And he thinks about it, but his father says, no, 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 that's, that's for losers. And you can be better, uh, more prosperous in business, that sort of thing. But as it happens, his girlfriend, Carmen, has decided to join to become a pilot because in this, in this society, uh, female pilots are highly prized. In fact, they're considered to be better than male pilots. So he, he joins partly because he thinks he's going to be able to be with her. It follows his experience as a uh, general frontline soldier uh, in Grunt and then his progression uh, to become a war hero and an officer in the continuing war. 
And a lot of it is also flashback to Rico's high school days when he had this very influential teacher who had talked about uh, the responsibility of the citizens and, and why the society requires you to be a veteran in order to vote. And the teacher, he and the teacher exchange letters too, which also kind of motivates Johnny. I did enjoy the book. I had to say that I uh, appreciate the experience of somebody who's been through the military, as Heinlein was. And though I enjoyed the book and I enjoyed the battle scenes and the idea, a lot of the ideas expounded in here, I did think there was a little bit too much philosophizing, which is a, a kind of a continuing problem, problem about Heinlein's books. Though it was done kind of Socratically in the sense that, you know, there's this, this discussion between the teacher and the students, which is a lot better than, you know, the author just dumping it on the reader. And I did find the idea of, of the earn, earning the franchise kind of interesting. It's, it, to me, it seems to have some merit, because early in the American, uh, the American history, when it was limited to landowners, uh, it seems like the country was a little bit more responsible, at least fiscally speaking, <laughs> uh, th than it was when everybody, <laughs> including people on public assistance, could vote, could vote themselves more goodies. And so we have a situation now where the country is deeply in debt. I also found it interesting that there was no conscription, no draft, uh, which was a constant feature of American life from around 1941 uh, through 1972, and it was something that was hanging over all of our heads as young men, and uh, Highland didn't believe in it, which is probably one of the reasons that libertarians have embraced his work. So I like that too. So I, I also like the idea of, of power armor. That's a cool, that's a cool innovation. And, and although I don't think Heinlein invented it, he, he was definitely the one who popularized it. And now it's a staple of science fiction military stories. And it is kind of the great equalizer, and which is why in a lot of these stories that uh, women have a prominent role in the infantry, although not in Heinlein's book. I believe there are, are a small minority of female foot soldiers, but Nonetheless, they still mostly have it being male because men are more aggressive. Men are stronger and more aggressive than women. I mean, I hate to break it to you folks, but men and women are different. <laughs> and, uh, and they do have different strengths and weaknesses. And again, as I said, women are prized as pilots in this world. And so it's not like, you know, Heinlein is anti-woman in any sense of the word. He also recognized uh, that conflict is inevitable and that the struggle will continue with it. There will be war in the future, and I think that's probably, probably the case. Now, it's interesting to note Heinlein's motivation for writing this book. Uh, as I might have said, it was his last YA book, written in 1959. And at the time, he was working on a book called Stranger in a Strange Land, which was kind of groundbreaking. In fact, a rather hippy-dippy kind of... Uh, uh, viewpoint strangely prescient for the for the 1960s kind of free love uh, milieu because as I said Heinlein was kind of a social liberal and a lot of his uh, books portray a very different kind of uh, lifestyles and so he was not a fascist by any definition of the word but at the time uh, Eisenhower was president and uh, he had decided to stop nuclear testing. And the Soviets were still doing it. So Heinlein was very upset and he you know, wrote letters to the editor and so on and saying that the United States should not do that while the Soviets are still doing it and that we have to have peace through strength, which is a reasonable viewpoint. So I can understand why he was upset. Now the book, as far as the reception, it was controversial from the beginning, but you know, if it had been written today, well it couldn't even be published today. Let's, let's be honest. There's no way. But they had a lot of popular response, I mean, there was a lot of positive response to Heinlein's book, and he actually won the Hugo Award in 1960 for the best novel. And yet there was a huge debate, and a, a big debate between critics and sci-fi writers, other fellow writers. It really spawned a lot of discussion, which is a very good thing. And on the left, they call him a fascist, of course, because of the military thing and because of the capital punishment thing. And they also called him a racist because, well, because he 
they had mean names for the enemy aliens. <laughs> As if this isn't something that has been happening from time immemorial and probably will continue forever. But nonetheless, for example, uh, the uh, alien arachnids are called bugs. And uh, it's like a racist term, right? And these, the aliens, the bugs, had this, uh, these allies that were tall, slender hominids that the, that the Earth soldiers called skinnies, which ironically was the same thing that American GIs called the Somalis when they were occupying uh, Somalia in the 90s. <laughs> and you know how that turned out. But anyway, they also said that, uh, the critics also said that uh, the bugs were a metaphor for the Asian yellow hordes. <laughs> to be frank, I think that the critics who, who demonized the book were, were basically expressing selective outrage because Heinlein was anti-communist. And, you know, these, a lot of these progressives, they may have, not have admitted it, but they were very pro-communist. They thought that that was a good thing. And uh, so anybody who was anti-communist had to be a fascist. And if Heinlein's bugs had been more akin to Nazis or perhaps uh, North American Confederates, then I'm sure they would have been all for it. <laughs> Just my two cents. As for the movie, <laughs> now here we come to a, an interesting, interesting story. And in fact, I don't know if Critical Drinker has ever talked about this, but it would definitely fit one of his production hell se segments because <laughs> there was a lot of trouble in getting this movie made. What happened at, at, in the early 90s, there was a, a screenwriter called Ed Neumeyer who was writing a treatment called Bug Hunt at Outpost 7, a story about uh, uh, Earth soldiers fighting alien bugs. And he brought this to TriStar Pictures and he talked to this exec there and the exec said, yeah, I like it. But it's a lot like Starship Troopers. Have you read that? <laughs> and Neumeyer had not read it, so he went and read it, and he kind of liked it. He thought it had a lot of strengths and some weaknesses, including, you know, a little bit too much philosophizing, like I said. And, <clears throat> and at the same time, he said, if we adapt this to be a screen version of Starship Troopers, we'll get the fan base for that book, because already there were a lot of games and video games being made on this concept, and there were some anime f from Japan in the late 80s, which I have not seen, uh, being made from that. And so Neumeyer said, yeah, that's a good idea, let's do that. So they bought the rights to Starship Troopers, and Neumeyer wrote his screenplay, and he was pretty faithful to the book, and he actually showed it to uh, Robert Heinlein's widow, and she approved of it. She, she thought it was a good adaptation. But what happened was uh, that same exec had a good friend uh, named Paul Verhoeven, <laughs> a director, and he had some sci-fi movies under his belt, so he said, yes, you, you're going to do my movie, right? And as it happened, Verhoeven was a poor choice. Not saying that he was a bad director, but his politics were so antagonistic to Heinlein. In fact, he started reading the book, and he quit after two chapters saying it was boring and horribly right-wing. And understandable, it's a little bit understandable because uh, Verhoeven was from the Netherlands. He was a small child when the Nazis had occupied his country, so he had that kind of very anti-war um, idea in his mind. Of course, you know, of course the Americans had to come in and uh, <laughs> liberate his country too, right? He eventually change a lot in the movie, and, it, and it, he said, you know what, I'm not going to do this faithful adaptation. I'm going to do a deconstruction. <laughs> I'm going to make this a satire of, of Heinlein's ideas. I'm going to mock it. And, and so that's what he did, and that's why the movie seems so contrary to one of Heinlein's works. At the same time, <laughs> because there's a lot of critics who, are, who have no sense of irony, a lot of them saw Verhoeven himself as a fascist. He says, oh my god, how can you support this horrific book? When really, really in reality, it was, it was a mockery of Highland's book, and they were just too thick to see it. But nonetheless, it was an interesting movie with some serious flaws, in my opinion. So, as Johnny Rico, they hired uh, Casper Van Dien, who was 
mostly a soap opera actor, but this was his big break. He had been in Beverly Hills 90210, uh, but other than that, he hadn't done anything major. And as Carmen, Denise Richards, who was a popular and very lovely model that had started an acting career. It was kind of interesting to see them, especially Richards, who was really the only one... Well, wait, no. There was another actor that I was familiar with in this movie, and it was Neil Patrick Harris, the very talented uh, Doogie Howser, and who's gone on to do a lot of other great things in his career. So, one of the things that Verhoeven changed is he made the society a lot more fascistic. And, in, and one of those things was you had to have permission to have children because of the overpopulation, which was not in Heinlein's book. And if you were in the military, you could get permission a lot more easily. And it also, it kind of minimizes the boot camp segment, understandably. You have to leave stuff out. It leaves out the bit on the, uh, with the raid on the planet of the skinnies. And he throws in a lot of very cheesy propaganda, like, you know, some very, like, 1984 type, uh, Big Brother is watching type stuff. And more like, you know, the bugs are coming to get us. Join the military. Join the space marines. And do your part. And, and, and actually, a little bit reminiscent of, you know, the 1940s U.S. propaganda, U.S. anti-Nazi propaganda. And so the citizens were very jingoistic and they were paid, portrayed as very brainwashed. And so there was a lot less nuance in that. And in fact, uh, Neil Patrick Harris's character, he's a political officer and he, he's, his uniform is very much like the Gestapo uniforms. Oh, although it is, a, it is a striking uniform. I mean, it was Hugo Boss, right, that designed those stuff. <laughs> so, but yeah, it was silly. There weren't any psychics in the book and so he's this uh, Gestapo-like psychic that's, you know, there to ferret out treason, I guess. And another weird thing, of course, they always do this in movies, is that teacher, Johnny Rico's teacher, who is a totally different person in the book, he becomes the same as this heroic Lieutenant Rachak, Rachak uh, that was a leader of the platoon that uh, Johnny was in, Rachak's Rough Riders. It, it was kind of silly, <laughs> you know, this teacher. Suddenly he's in the military again. And in, as I said in the book, they were totally different characters. Another thing that was interesting was the shower scene. <laughs> Everybody talked about the shower scene. It was very, it was very uh, notable because there hadn't been that much nudity. I mean, there was a lot of nudity in the 70s and early 80s when you know the government had had eased up its restrictions. At the same time, it really kind of petered out in the in the 90s, you know, political correctness and whatnot, I guess. So, so it was like when they had this scene when, with male and female recruits showering together in this big room, all butt naked. <laughs> and uh, it was funny because Verhoeven had this political reason for, reasoning for this. He said, because they're fascist, uh, they have no libido, and so they're able to shower together with the opposite sex, which I found hilarious, considering that uh, it's the left who, who seems to be trying to erase the distinction between male and female these days. There are um, no power suits in the movie, and that reason was mostly budgetary. They did, just didn't have the, have the budget to animate that stuff, although they do wear armor. Uh, but it was good they didn't have, make them wear more armor, because where they're filming in the desert, I guess, they had a lot of actors pass out from heat stroke. And finally, the climactic scene uh, where, where Johnny kind of saves the day, they had to make that over the top. <laughs> had, to be, had to be really super dramatic and, you know, adding a nuclear device and, and he has to rescue Carmen, which I don't recall from the book. And though, to be fair, the ending is kind of similar in that the war continues. You know, Johnny's a war hero, he's a, an officer, but the war continues. The uh, movie and the book had some similarity in the narrative, but they were very, very different. Uh, there's an interesting note about the shower scene uh, because they said that uh, the actors were uncomfortable with it. So uh, Verhoeven and the cameraman sent all the rest of the crew out and they took off their clothes too, <laughs> which was kind of a, a kind of a nice gesture. The other problem I had with this movie was the military strategy seemed really ridiculous. I mean, they didn't seem to have any strategy. Uh, kind of like Vietnam, where we didn't seem to have much of a, of a coherent strategy either. 
So they were sending these guys down to the surface of the bug planet, and they're, they're battling these aliens who are way more powerful than a human being, and they're like, the alien bug will just spear them through the chest and go right through the armor, and, and they, they die. And it's like, what is this, suicide? Is this like when they had to charge machine gun nests in World War I? I mean, it was ridiculous. And so you thought, well, why did they just nuke this planet from orbit? <laughs> of course, there was a, a there was a human colony that was besieged, and then of course you have to go down and you know go one and one, but just just didn't make a lot of sense. I thought the book it made a lot more sense. So another thing I did not know about Starship Troopers until very recently was that there were two sequels, and they went straight to DVD, and oh, neither were directed by Verhoeven, and uh, Castor Van Dien even was not. And I don't think Richards was in either of them, but Van Dien was in the third one. I was kind of disappointed seeing reading the summaries that uh, human societies become even more fascist and that they are now like hanging peace protesters. And, and it's like, I don't think that's where Heinlein was going. I really don't. But, of course, when you take Verhoeven's deconstruction and you take it to its logical conclusion, that's where you get. Also, there were two Japanese computer animated uh, treatments of it that came out in the 2010s, and I do intend to watch those. Those sound like they might be interesting, but the Japanese aren't so hung up on uh, wokeness, <laughs> which is one of the reasons that I'm such an anime fan, because you don't have to have forced diversity, you don't have to have all this ap apology for our culture and our heritage and that stuff. So, uh, on the hopeful side, uh, I guess Neil Moritz, who has worked, produced, I think, some of the Fast and Furious movies. He's interested in doing another remake of Starship Troopers, one that was more faithful to the book. And I hope that happens. I, I really look forward to that. I, was de I would definitely see that. So, summarizing, uh, the book and the movie are very different. <laughs> and I much enjoyed the book with the major flaw being too much sermonizing, so I'd give it four and a half years. And as far as the movie, very disappointing, except for a few you know, decent battle scenes and an interesting shower scene, <laughs> I'll give it three years at most. So, this has been my review, my comparative review on Starship Troopers, book versus movie. And I might do some more of these in the future, so look for those. Please let me know what you think about, about this in the comments below, whether you like the movie better, the, the book better, whether you liked them both or whether you hated them both. And I would like to see a few more posts. I haven't gotten too much reaction and I really want to see some. Also, please like and subscribe. That helps us get out the good steampunk word and also talk about sci-fi and fantasy from my own unique and unpolitically correct viewpoint. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying, adios amigos, from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.